Hopefully you enjoy this uh, podcast with John Sharp from the Bletchley Foundation. Um, they're doing some great work and researching into psychedelics and, and other uh, plant medicine type things. Uh, please go to their website. I'm going to put 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 place for their website now on the on the screen, and go and donate and help them out. And th- th- this this work's really important. It can it can help people with depression and, and PTSD and all sorts of other things. Uh, it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, even people with drug and alcohol problems, it, it can help them in that too. So um, I think it's a very worthwhile foundation. Uh, so please go there, have a look what they're doing uh, and donate if you can, if you've got anything to spare. Also, please like, share, subscribe. <laughs> Thanks very much. Peace out. Let's let's start. I'm here today with John Sharp from the Beckley Foundation, uh, kindly joining me. Uh, I'll read your blurb from your website. The Beckley Foundation pioneers psychedelic research to drive evidence-based drug policy reform, founded and directed by Amanda Fielding as a UK-based think tank and NGO. Um, let's start with the beginning of this. How did you get into this field? Um. So I studied neuroscience um, at university at King's College London. Um, And I remember there was one lecture. We had a really wonderful um, pharmacology lecturer called uh, Ian McFadgen and uh, and a good pharmacology course. And um, Mm -hmm. there was one lecture about psychoactive drugs. You know, the pharmacology was all about your aspirins and your uh, SSRI antidepressants. And you're spending a whole year studying all that. And then one hour... They crammed in uh, cannabis, LSD, MDMA, um, <laughs> and all that. Um, and I thought, wow, this is uh, this is really interesting. And um, I decided that's what I wanted to, to kind of specialize in um, later. Um, I did my research project uh, for my master's degree uh, looking at alcohol, which was the closest I could get to um, kind of doing a bit of research into Sorry, it's, um, coming, it's going in and out for some reason. It could be my microphone. I don't know whether it's my end or not. Yeah, well, you look like you have a much more professional setup there than I do. With let, my, me chat, uh, let, let me let me that. change to. Uh, let's see if this works better. Can we try now? Yeah, uh, okay, yeah. So, cool. um, I did a little bit of research for my master's course uh, at UCL, so University College mm-hmm. London, uh-huh. uh, looking at alcohol and how it changes impulsivity um, mm-hmm. in adolescence and that was the closest I could get to doing some kind of research project with uh, with some psychoactive illicit uh, kind of uh-huh. substances and then um, yeah so took a little bit of a break after I got my master's degree and um, but I still really wanted to get back into this field and um, Beckley Foundation obviously is is one of the kind of certainly in the UK is the leading um, sort of NGO talking about these kinds of issues and promoting this research um, and it's involved in most of the um, big psychedelic research studies that have been going on in the UK for the past decade or so. So I uh, sent off my job application and here I am. Wicked. I, I didn't realise that because I've seen a lot of stuff from, that's going on in the US because I think They've legalized psilocybin, haven't they, in Oregon, is it? Yes, yeah. Um, um, I didn't realize that the, the studies were going on in the UK. I thought they were still sort of kept aside until I started looking, you know, and it was nice to see that see, see that people are doing stuff over in the UK as well. You know, and I, I know, like, there's certain people that advocate it, like um, Joe Stamets and um, oh, what's his name now? He always talks about ayahuasca. Uh, Graham Hancock. He, yes, he's always yeah. he's always talking about things, so he's, they're push they're pushing that agenda. And I've seen some uh, mushroom um, conferences that go on in the UK, but I didn't realise there's a lot of research going on. How much how much research has the Beckley Found Beckley Foundation done? And well, an awful lot. I mean, the UK, funnily enough, to be despite the kind of political environment, which historically and continues to be kind of anti drug and I don't see legalizations you know coming anytime soon as it is in Oregon or in the US um, but a lot of the psychedelic research that's been going on really 
the UK is one of the world leaders. You would say the UK, the US are the, the big players in that. Mm -hmm. So in the US, you've got Johns Hopkins. Um, but in the UK, Imperial College London um, was the first uh, institution in the world to set up a dedicated um, psychedelic research center. Okay. And the Beckley Foundation um, set up the, the Beckley Imperial uh, Research Program. So our director and founder, Amanda Fielding, Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Dave Nutt over at Imperial uh, collaborated together to set up this with this research program. Um, and some of the world firsts of psychedelic research came out of that collaboration. So the very first study looking at psilocybin um, mm -hmm. as an antidepressant, which obviously yep. nowadays is getting a lot of headlines and a lot of media attention and a lot of investment from big um, pharma, as they say. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that comes from a, an initial feasibility study done um, at Imperial College with uh, Robin Carthard Harris as the, mm -hmm. as the principal investigator. So, so what, what was the um, sort of premise for that? Because I see a lot of the stuff you're doing is micro dosing now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Which is um, the, the, the in thing, isn't it really, for, for, for psychedelics and MDMA as well, and, and, and also DMT, isn't it, for, for micro dosing things? What what, what was that first study? Was that a full-on um, LSD experience or psilocybin experience, or was it more the microdosing? Um, moderate doses, yeah. Not a microdose, for sure. Not okay. a microdose. As you say, microdosing, I mean, it's been going on in these kind of underground circles for quite a lot of time, but it's only really relatively recently that the mainstream attention has turned towards microdosing. I think okay. as... Um, as it's become more mainstream, this idea that psychedelics can be beneficial. There are some people that are put off by the idea of tripping, right? Or having these hallucinations or what have you. Mm -hmm. I read all sorts of scare stories in the Daily Mail or whatever. And um, yeah, that's just not for them, perhaps. So microdosing op offers this quite unique opportunity that maybe we can get some of the benefits of psychedelics without having to put people through this quite intense experience. Um, but yeah, we're looking at microdosing as well. Yeah, so, so what's your most recent studies on the microdosing? What's, what have they been coming back with? What, what, has, it, has it been totally positive or mixed or, 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 or what? Yeah, mixed, I think would be, it would be fair to say. So we've mm -hmm. got two main kind of microdosing programs going on at the moment. We've got a yeah. collaboration um, with Maastricht University in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. and then we've got the Imperial College collaboration as well. So um, the Maastricht one, I think, was set up in 2016. Amanda set that up and, uh -huh. um, with uh, Jan Rumakers uh, over there. And the one they're doing at the moment, it's called the LSD Microdosing Dose Finding Study or, or something to that effect. OK. Um, and they found some quite interesting things. So, for example, if you take a microdose of LSD, so something like 20 micrograms, about one tenth mm -hmm. of what people would normally take to trip, um, that can increase levels of something called BDNF, a brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's this protein that's associated with um, making new neurons, making new synapses and protecting the brain and growing uh, the, the brain cells. And it increases levels of this BDNF in your blood at just these doses of 20 micrograms, 10 micrograms, uh, 5 micrograms. So is that... Well, I'm, I'm not... Not really au okay fait with this little question now, so I, I'm, I'm asking this from a point of ignorance, I suppose. Is, is that like a nootropic effect? Is, is that the same thing? Because I, 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 I read it on your website, I had, a, I had a little look at it. So is that similar to a nootropic effect that you'll get? Because I've seen that you get that through exercise as well, that BDNF. -E um, what do you mean, as in a, what do you mean by nootropic? So like, um, Caffeine's nootropic, um, tobaccos are nootropics. So things that f make activate your brain. But I, I've seen that BDNF right, is no, like it's, a... it's not just activating the brain. It's it's specifically promoting the growth and maintenance of brain cells. Okay. So it, it sort of repairs your brain cells, keeps your brain cells working properly, enables your synapses to connect and connections and everything. Yeah. That's the thinking. That, yeah. That, that's the thinking. Cause I wasn't um, quite sure when I was reading up on it, yeah. what, what it actually was, whether it works similar to that as well. 
So we've got that one, the, 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 the finding that it increases this BDNF, and that's exciting stuff. Uh -huh. um, we've also, that very same um, dose finding study, um, looked at LSD microdosing for pain um, as okay. a potential treatment for pain. So back in the 60s and the 70s, before uh, psychedelics were, were criminalized and, and made taboo, mm -hmm. some studies were done on testing their ability as, a, as an analgesic, as a painkiller. Um, but only at these high doses. So some people had some quite unpleasant experiences, didn't really enjoy it very much. Um, so imagine. we're looking at it um, in these microdoses. Mm -hmm. um, and if you give somebody a 20 microgram dose of LSD and yeah. you get them to stick their hand in a very cold ice bath, right? not, okay. not pleasant, painfully cold. And then you test how long they can keep their hand in that ice bath. And that's a good measure for pain. They, they use this for other studies as well, just to mm -hmm. test uh, painkillers. Um, and LSD, 20 micrograms, increases uh, the your pain tolerance by this measure by something around 60%. Wow. Um, which is equivalent to your conventional opioid painkillers. Mm -hmm. Wow, so, that's, that's, that's a lot then, isn't it, really? Yeah. Because that, I mean, they, some of the media was saying, you know, could LSD replace opiates? Mm -hmm. I don't know about that, but certainly that finding at least is quite dramatic. Yeah, because when, when I when I've looked at stuff that like, for want of a better word, heroin is is arguably the best painkiller that we've got. Mm. Still, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not. I haven't studied this. So from from these things that I've heard in the past, uh, still now that opium or heroin is probably the strongest painkiller that we've got, and it's difficult to replicate something that strong. So if you're getting up to those levels, that that's like, seriously good, isn't it? It is. I mean, the fun thing about, well, the fun thing, the interesting thing about your opiates, your heroin and, and so on, is that they're not just painkillers in the sense that they, you know, stick onto the pain receptor and stop you feeling pain, but they're also working in the brain to make you not care about mm. the pain. They numb your, yeah. your, you know, you might feel it and go, oh, but I don't care. You know, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it hurts, but I'm, I'm just not bothered. It totally separates you from that that experience that's one of the strengths of your opiates yeah i can give you an example because i'm like i'm recovering drug addict so i and, and i used to take heroin like 20 odd years ago and I, I remember having a cigarette and falling asleep and i knew it was here but it just kept burning and burning in me you know what i mean and it's like right so you can feel it but you just i, I wasn't moving yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like but yeah i've not noticed that from because i've only recently got back into plant medicines and things because I've suffered for all my adult life. I, I'm, I'm not sure about my child life. And I've, I've noticed it, re it really helps me, um, you know, taking ayahuasca and, and, and psilocybin. So that's why I was really interested to speak to you because it, it was a difficult step for me to take. And I should imagine the normal public, it's going from that's a drug that's bad because we've had all that propaganda about it. And now it's like, oh, it's a medicine. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, and, and it, it, it's difficult. How, how's your foundation dealing with that problem of public opinion, which is, I, I should imagine, is going to be the most difficult thing? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the sort of two pronged approach that mm -hmm. one has to take, right? You've got the science on the one hand, but then you've got the policy and the public opinion on the other hand. Yep. And certainly in the UK, I think we're very resistant to this idea that, that, um, that drugs could be beneficial, or so-called drugs can be mm -hmm. beneficial. And yet, you know, you go down any town centre in the UK on a Friday or Saturday night and there's hordes of people uh, mm -hmm. off their mind on, on alcohol, which is yeah. just as much a drug as, as ayahuasca or heroin or, you know, MDMA or what have you. Mm -hmm. um so yeah it's a big it's going to be a big challenge to change these public opinions and the the idea that uh, a lot of people are going for at the moment and, and, and amanda fielding and the becky foundation would be on that uh, same wavelength is that if we can educate people about the scientific merits of these uh, compounds the medicinal merits then that might help to change opinion because mm -hmm. there's this kind of idea that well if it doesn't do anything beneficial then it's, it's useless. Let's get rid of it. You know, yeah. we don't want people just having fun. We want people, you know, uh, healing. That's what the, the, the media would say anyway.
Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's the difference I noticed between when I used to recreationally take it and, and, and now when I take it as a medicine. It's massively different. I didn't get those benefits before when it was like, well, hey, let's go and get off my head. Mm. I, I didn't get it. I didn't get the effect because I wasn't mentally right with it. Now it's different. Um, something I said to someone the other day is because they were saying, oh, be careful and all this. And I said, doing this enables me to live a better life now here. You know, um, I, I don't get so depressed. I don't get so angry about things. I don't get so stressed about small problems. You know, I'm able to see things in a better light. It, it, it's just, it's been almost miraculous for me in a way, you know, it's been on top of other things, but I, I've found it so beneficial that I want to speak to people. I want to get it, everyone to know about it if I can. And as you said, I don't know if it is for everybody as well. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. It's, it's like, try these things if, if, you, if you feel it. A lot of times I'll take a high dosage of things, so it's a bit different. But um, what's the, have you been doing studies on high dosage, medium dosage and low dosages or or just focusing on the micro dosing now? So like I said, the micro dosing thing is actually a more recent. So historically, yeah, it would be these higher doses. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was an idea for a long time and it's still, uh, you know, a a theory that, that could prove to be true that a lot of these therapeutic benefits your antidepressant effects your anti-addictive effects um, you won't get those until and unless somebody has these so-called peak mystical type experiences Mm -hmm. these full-on you know earth shattering kind of um, mind-bending experiences so it could be that you need this that this is a a key part of the Mm -hmm. therapeutic mechanism and that's, that's one idea, certainly. We're in our um, study, of looking at psilocybin as an antidepressant, um, the power of that mystical experience, the strength of that mystical experience was correlated with the extent to which people's depression was um, turned down. Uh-huh. So it, they could go hand in hand. So, yeah, maybe microdosing might be uh, useful, but maybe also you might need these big wallop high okay. doses. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, and, I, and I'm just thinking on the fly now, sort of thing. So, possibly the big dose, micro dose after would be the potentially the, a, a very beneficial way of doing it, or possibly, possibly. I couldn't say for sure. I mean, the, yeah. the research into microdosing at the moment is at a very early stage, um, mm-hmm. and we're still looking to see whether it is even real you know a Uh lot of the reports they're anecdotal reports they're people that have been sharing their findings on the internet for a long time and it's only literally this past couple of years that we've started really testing it in the lab placebo controlled Uh and what have you to try and figure out is this actually a thing um maybe maybe it's a thing but also the placebo effect could play some role and we're just not sure yet placebos work don't they you know they they, yeah uh, yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And that's one thing is, you know, psychedelics, this talk of set and setting, right? You'll yep. be aware of that, that you said yourself, you know, um, it's not for everybody. Maybe you have to be in the right state of mind. And maybe yep. when you were taking them recreationally, you weren't in that state of mind. But when you're looking at it, trying to have some benefit, then it has some benefit. Mm-hmm. And there's an idea that maybe psychedelics actually directly interact with the part of your brain, the part of your psychology that is responsible for the placebo effect. Mm-hmm. that it turns up the influence that things like your your environment or your mental headspace can have on you um so it could be placebo effect might play a role but it, it might play a really important role in, in moderating the effect yeah yeah for, and this is anecdotal you know so from my experience recently of doing this i i don't see anyone come out of this that doing these ceremonies we'll call them who's more angry it's normally more loving more caring uh, more in tune with nature as well is one of the big things that i've found that people come out with it it's there's that going back to the to, to the roots of of what we are as humans and not this i need a new tv i need a new car i need this i need that i need a new house 
And like I was back in the UK recently and I, and I really felt that when I was in the UK, you know, it's so everyone needs a brand new BMW, everybody, and everyone's getting them on lease now. So, and it's just debt and house. And, and I, I don't feel that when I'm here in, in, in Colombia, um, it's, it's a totally different environment, but I don't feel that in myself when I'm away, mm. you know, and I, and I, I feel that, that when when I've done psychedelics, it's, it enhances that that feeling of I only need what I need, you know, and I'm happy with what I've got, uh, and I, and you know I care about other people more than I care about money, which is which is a um, it's a really nice thing. It's a really nice feeling as well. Yeah. There's a lot of talk, isn't there, about this you know, mental health epidemic, mm. so-called, that the Western cultures are, are going through and this increase in depression and anxiety. And who knows, it could be that this feeling that you have to buy the latest BMW and the latest flat screen TV and this pressure of, of keeping up with the Joneses and uh, nowadays with social media as well. And you know, you're looking around the world and you're seeing everybody and you're comparing yourself with everybody. Maybe maybe yeah. that contributes to this and these mental health problems and if psychedelics can help to pull people back from that a little bit and look at themselves and be content with what they've mm -hmm. got then that could be one way that they help people yeah especially with the current climate with i i, I think what six months from now i, I think that it's going to be an uh, the epidemic is going to be mental health after after being locked down and and so many people in financial difficulties i think that uh, it's going to need more and more. Uh, it's going to be the, the, the biggest thing. Have you noticed an uptake in people applying and things during this period over the... So um, we don't actually the um, deal directly with people applying for okay. uh, for the trial. So we work uh -huh. with the universities and the research institutions, um, but we're not responsible for the participant recruitment. We still do get emails um, from yep. people, but we then have to you know send them to places where mm -hmm. they can they can apply. Um, so I wouldn't say that we've noticed that necessarily, um, but there is a lot of talk. Yeah, this 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 COVID-19 uh, epidemic could lead to a later mental health epidemic. And I think you're onto something there. Yeah. And this could be even worse once the, um, the job hits start to come. There's talk that, you know, there could be unemployment. There could be um, financial difficulties that come from this as well. And that's just going to exacerbate the situation further. And mm. you, these are there are many different crises that societies are going to be going through. There's COVID, that's one thing, but then you've got the environmental, the looming environmental crisis that we've mm -hmm. probably got coming up in the next 20 years, 30 years, if things aren't done. Um, and it could be that we're, we're at exactly the right moment for, for some kind of new approach to medicines, mental health treatments. And if, as you say, it can make people feel a little bit more in touch with nature, then that it's no bad thing right now as well no yeah you know you, you come out I, I don't know if you've you've been to south america or you've been somewhere where you can take where you can take these legally um but you, you you come out of it with a totally different different look on life um you know and it's, it's one of those ones where you, you come out and you're like oh, man imagine if everybody tried this <laughs> mm. you know it'd be would, would the world be a better place you know so uh it's a it, tempting it, thought it's a tempting thought but um I'm a, I'm a bit of a cynic. I don't know. I, I used to think that I used to have that idea that, oh, you know, what if, what if everybody did it? It's a little bit 1960s, right? It's a little bit kind of, uh, if only the world could just uh, love each other a little bit more then yeah. everything would be great. But um, it could be that psychedelics can just reinforce what's already kind of within you a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, that, that if you're uh, a little bit towards the, the left or, or you're uh, progressive or something, then maybe it'll, it'll entrench those beliefs and if you lean a little bit towards the right and you're a little bit more conservative it could entrench those beliefs as well i mean there was this report that one of the fellas that was breaking into the capitol building in in america that he was a, a psychedelics advocate so just because you're into these kind of substances doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be um and i suppose if you're a person. psychopath it might enhance that as well yeah which yeah, maybe you know, you don't which, know. which comes to, comes to these things as well as it is the right person and uh, mm -hmm. and people who are in the right spot to do it. You know, there's a lot that when you talk about set and setting and a friend of mine's just starting to do some ceremonies now and he's, he's having a group beforehand to set all that up to, to make sure everyone's in the right place, which I, I really agree with, you know, that, that 
making sure when, when people are doing these things is making sure that they're, they're in the right headspace, not giving away willy nilly. And yeah, we'll go and we'll just have some funny. Um, a, a friend of mine did it, came with me to something. He thought he was just going to be on a jolly and it, it was profound for him. Uh, yeah. I mean, massively profound, uh, more than I've ever seen anyone, anyone before that the, the, the change in how he felt and how he seen things was, was unbelievable. It was like, Oh, wow. You know, the, the, there is, there is massive potential. Mm, that's why well, it's so important that people, um, if they're going to use them as medicines to try and deal with some kind of underlying trauma, that they're careful with where they go. I mean, how was your experience over in Colombia? I assume you, you had this experience, right? Or these, I, if, if, I, I was traveling last, last year. I was cycling around South America. So um, I'm back in Colombia now because I don't like being in the UK. But um, yeah, Colombia, Ecuador and, and Peru. So my, my experience, first time I ever took ayahuasca was the first thing that was the first thing I tried. Um, for two weeks after, normally inside my head is like there's an argument. It's like, like a football match. Well, not nowadays. Like in the old days when they used to have crowds at football matches. In my head, it was like that. Just loads of noise. I had two weeks of peace. And, I, and it was, you know... I, I've never been diagnosed with PTSD, but I have, I have a lot of the symptoms, what I've read, so I can't say I've got it. You know, I'd always have that, okay, I'm ready for a fight, ready for something to happen all the time. I didn't have that, you know, and, I, and these things were like, that was amazing, you know? It was like, whoa, this is unbelievable. Then I had a couple of not-so-good experiences with it where the... The ayahuasca wasn't very good. One, one was more like a poison. And it put me off for a bit. I didn't, didn't go anywhere near it. Then I got stuck in Trujillo. And I was there for four months, stuck in a, in a room on my own. And I suppose that got me through that, that period of time because I'd go out on a Friday night. There, there was a massive draconian lockdown. You weren't meant to go out the house only for shopping. But I'd go, and go to this guy's house and have groups of people doing ayahuasca. And it really helped me through that time. I wasn't getting so angry about things. I wasn't getting so frustrated about things. I started doing this podcast and, you know, it, it, I, I believe it really helped me and it, it gives you what you need is, is what a lot of people say. And, I, and I, I would believe that as well as a lot of times that you, you come out not getting what you, what you wanted, which is all the hallucinations, which is the fun bit, but it, it, it straightens your head out and it, it gets it in the right, the right place. You know, so it's, uh, yeah, that's that. And then when I've come back now, I've, I've tried different things. So um, psilocybin mushrooms and some DMT. And, and um, I don't know if you've heard of Bufo, which is the... The 5-MeO uh, DMT sourced the, from the... The toad, toad yeah. Right? The Sonoran uh, Desert toad. Mm. I can't explain that. So, yeah, how does that compare to your ayahuasca experience then? It's, it's phenomenal. It after that I, I wasn't worried about dying it, it wow. felt like it, it, it's, it's always I'm always reticent to talk about this in a way because you, you sound crazy you know uh, it felt uh, the best explanation is that I was shot out up towards the sun somewhere and and I was just a consciousness and I was somewhere else uh, I'm hoping that's where I go when I die you know, right. and if it is, yeah. I've got somewhere good to go to when I finish using this body. If not, I, I just die anyway. So I, I'm quite happy with that, that, that um, thinking in my head. It, it just makes living this life a lot easier because it, it, you think that you've got somewhere nice to go to, you yeah. know, um, whether that's a placebo or it's real, you know, I, I'll, we'll only find out. Well, I mean, I in that sense, um, if you, if, that would be difficult to say that's a placebo, right? You had that experience. That was real. You saw this thing. You felt this thing. Yeah. It would be very difficult to apply the word placebo to, to something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's that's consistent with what a lot of people report from 5-MeO-DMT. So that's the, the compound that's in, in the bufo. Yeah. Um, these near-death experience-like mm -hmm. experiences, this this, yeah. uh, this thing. And um, how... How did that compare to ayahuasca? Did you did you have anything like that with ayahuasca, or it was specific to the bufo? 
I, I was curious more a mental for me for more of a mental experience more like a conversation i have a lot with ayahuasca um what one thing about ayahuasca is i'm not to sound too arrogant now again I, I it's 20 years since 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 i stopped taking drugs and drinking uh i've spent a lot of time with an alcoholics anonymous so there was a lot of time of me and, and treatment and things like that so there's a lot of time of me you know looking into myself doing things on myself. And then I, don't, I was fortunate to work at a company where we had a lot of management development, which is personal development as well. So I've done loads of that. And I can answer all of those questions and I can give you beautiful answers and I can sound amazing, but it never solves my problems. Yeah. What ayahuasca seemed to do for me was take me out of the equation and enable me to then work on those problems and you don't always work on them that day. You have to go away and do them. You know what I mean? And it enables me to, yeah, take me, take me out the equation, take my smart ass out the equation and, 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 and then develop it spiritually, I suppose, is the best way to do it, is, is the yeah. best way to say it. Yeah. You know, so the only other one where I've had a, a, an extreme experience was from a high dose of psilocybin. Um, and I don't know whether that was me putting those ideas into my head, but, I, you know, I, mushrooms are everywhere under the ground, aren't they? So it felt like I, I sort of disintegrated into under the ground and felt so much power from, coming, you know, uh, intelligence and power and, and knowledge from in the ground. It was like, well, that was like five minutes of a, what, four hours, but it was, it was like, wow. Mm. You know, it was, uh, it was spectacular. And, and the similar thing to the, to the Bufo, it felt like I went somewhere where all the knowledge in the world was. And it was like going in the best library in the world, you know, and it's just there. And it was, you know, I wish I could have brought it all back with me. <laughs> so that's one theory of what these near death experiences hmm. are. People report this, right? You know, you have a heart attack and yeah. come face to face with this glowing light or what have you, and, and uh, life flash before your eyes, so on and so forth, come back with this sense of peace and this new, this new sense of belonging. And, maybe the psychedelics and the powerful psychedelics and, uh, and the particularly high doses might be tapping into the same brain mechanisms that are responsible for that near-death experience. I mean, there was uh, one study that showed that uh, when a, a rodent, I think it was a, a rat, might have been a mouse, mm -hmm. when you induce a heart attack in this rodent, it increases the levels of DMT in the brain mm -hmm. quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. So there's this theory, right, that maybe... That yeah. is what a near-death experience is. So when you're on you're taking this bufo, you are in effect having a near-death experience. Yeah, you 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 know your body's there, but you're not in your body. Right. So that if, kind of if, if, if that, that makes any sense. Itself. Yeah, it, but you're not in any point in time or space either. Time time doesn't matter. There's no up or down. It, it you're just somewhere. That's what it feels. That's the feeling. Um, you know, I've, I've read a few books about resurrection and um, a, a really good book about the Knights Templar, which was going about that one of their main things was the resurrection process where you take a narcotic and then you'll be three days with a near-death experience and then you come back. And, and their philosophy was that the people who haven't done that are the, like walking dead and then you're alive and awake when you've done that. So it's like, um, Newton done it, um, Plato, Aristotle, a, a lot of these, these people, people have done that um, resurrection process. And, and even back with the Essens and everything before then, they were all doing it. And the Egyptians, some people think that the path in, in the pyramids is that because it goes from rough hewn up to really uh, marble effect, really high gloss finish, which is you going from a rough hum, human up to, to that. So the, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that potentially um, could be like that. And all over the world, there's, there's things in Siberia where they had a narcotic drink that they were building on a factory level, which was massive, you know? So it's it's got me really interested in all these things that the possibilities and, and what, what benefits this could have. Because the, the indigenous people here say that the plants speak to them or the gods told them about it because ayahuasca is a strange one, isn't it? These two plants don't grow next to each other. They're not like, oh, we've just 
thrown them into the pot by accident. The, yeah. You know, the, and in, in the Amazon, there's how many different plants? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there's millions, you know. So it's 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 you know it's it it does beg the question of how I don't know what how how's this been derived, you know? And um, again, I'm a, I'm a cynic. I'm a, a little bit more of a skeptic, maybe. So in that kind of situation, I would say you give people enough time um they'll they'll figure stuff like that out right i mean yeah. how did how did western society invent beer mm. you know who was the first person to milk a cow yeah. all these kind of things you know over time people do these crazy things you never hear about the guy who mixed this vine and this vine together drank it and Don't died it. yeah <laughs> yeah there is that and, and the other one is that someone's idea is that with the psilocybin is that the hindu religion is that's why they worship cows because they they crap in a field and their mushrooms grow out of it yeah. you know so possibly it's, it's, possibly, it's, you know, yeah. it's possible so how about you what's what's your take on it what's your experience or would um, you, you not say yeah it's a difficult one isn't it i um you'd be surprised really that the, there's a big range of different kinds of people in this industry in this field what mm -hmm. have you some people haven't taken anything at all yep some people are exactly the kind of ones you would expect and they're, they're, they've done everything under the sun uh -huh. 10 times you know um i've got a little bit of experience a little bit dabbling in terms of personal experience not as experienced as yourself by the sounds of things uh dabbled in university mm -hmm. um but after uni i went traveling um I lived in China for a while. I was I was going to speak to you about that. I see I seen that on your on your resume because I've I've worked in China and I was going to ask you where where you taught. Um, I was in Nanning in, uh, in Guangxi province in the southwest near okay. Vietnam, and then I was in Suzhou, which is about twenty minutes west of yeah, Shanghai. I love Suzhou. On the train. Yeah, I I, I I typed your name into YouTube as well. <laughs> I saw the video of you uh, cycling in Luoyang. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen all the comments? <laughs> On that I, I don't know. know I've got a stalker on there like they keep sending me comments going I wish you're dead I hope oh, you're wow. dead soon what did <laughs> you do? Like, <laughs> I've been doing this for about three years wow I, hey, I, I don't know whether it's when you know you've made it right if, if people on the internet want you to die you're probably doing something right there's only one person though <laughs> <laughs> you have to start somewhere right uh, yeah, so I don't know whether it, unless it's some girl that I've, I've, I've met while I was in China, I don't, I don't know. Chinese girl, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the, it, possibly the, there has been some strange experiences. I had to kick some girl out of my hotel room once and she was stood there crying. It's like, no, you got to go. Okay. <laughs> Dude, be, strange, yeah. strange stories when people go traveling, right? Different cultures combining. Yeah, I, like I normally live in Thailand, so, and then I've worked in China a lot. So I've ever worked in um Shenzhen, Shanghai, Zhengzhou, um, Weifang. So how, how did you find it out there? I liked it. I mean, well, the reason I mentioned it was well, I was going to say that you don't dabble in um, in illegal drugs when you're in a country like China. You know, it's uh, you get caught. It's, it could be death hmm. penalty or something like that. Not worth the uh, not worth the risk as far as I'm concerned. Um, how did I find it? I mean, it was better than I thought. Before I went out there, I thought uh, it's going to be quite a oppressive feeling, um, mm -hmm. sort of communist. You know, you'd feel it, but it, it, you don't. It's uh, the, it feels like America. It's it's very capitalist, very materialistic, um, very image driven, very hard working. They're quite uh, individualistic as as people as well. You know, you expect them to you know, all these cliche stereotypes of communist countries and all one vision one mind and it's not like that at all uh, they're very competitive very individualistic and a lot of open-minded people as well and you get this cynical sort of wink and a and a knowing smile whenever you try to talk about something that was maybe a little bit uh, mm. not so kosher yeah i quite enjoyed it it was certainly an experience um but the political climate there is getting more and more oppressive and, and, and strange at the moment yeah i i I find that on a day-to-day -day level, I don't notice the political stuff, if you know what I mean. You, when, when you're there, when I first went there, I hated it. And then after, after a bit of time, I, I don't mind it so much now. I, I prefer Thailand and I prefer Colombia. It's a lot more more relaxed and, and, uh, and nice. I don't like the food in Thailand's great. But, you know, like a lot of people, the stereotypes that you were saying about Chinese people, some of it's correct. 
uh, it's all we love China. If you if I can go through a lesson over there without someone saying to make China great again, we love yeah. China and to look after my parents, I think I've got a good lesson um, yeah. because they normally bring that in. Somehow they manage to shoehorn it into a conversation all the time. But I, I found people really helpful out there, really friendly. You know what I mean? And, and like like everywhere, which is which is another thing that I wanted to get. Where I, I don't know if you've seen one of my other pocket uh, other things is when I was cycling around, just showing how people around the world are, are people. Yeah. Everywhere yeah. around the world, people are people. You know, and most people, if you go through your friends, most people aren't horrible. Most people aren't trying to rip you off. Most people don't want to have wars. But, you know, and that's the majority of the people, but we, we don't that's see why that. travel. That's why travel is so beneficial, I think, for people. If you go into it with the right attitude, yeah, you realise that the vast majority of people, your average human, just wants the same things. They just want to be happy. They want to have a decent job. They want to have some you know, money and a, a fulfilling relationships with people and, mm -hmm. and so on. And you speak to most Chinese people and they'll say, you know, we don't want to be at war with America or what have you. And oh. it's going to be friends. Yeah. So do you get to speak to people after, or do you just watch, look at the reports of people after do, do, more anecdotal than anything about how people feel after they've done the, um, after they, they've done the, oh, I can't think of the word now, but the programs that you do, the mm -hmm. studies. Sorry. Sorry. So, you know when people have done the study do you, you obviously they'll have a debrief mm. um, what what other things have been coming up more anecdotal that, that you can't measure is is, is there anything any anything coming up or well i mean the the protocols generally try and try and measure the things that we would be interested in and um psychological evaluations come up mm. with all these uh questionnaires that can measure everything from your your depression scores anxiety scores your feeling of oneness with the universe and your uh what have you so we try to get um, a good measure of that yeah um whether there's something that, that's not included within that I, I i couldn't tell you i mean i don't personally administer the uh the tests so whether, i don't know if you've seen it because obviously it's going to be a detailed report but uh, do people feel that when they're coming out more oneness more togetherness is, is that a general consensus or is that yeah well there's um one uh, study that's found that that psychedelics increase uh, nature connectedness this feeling mm. of oneness with nature and yeah, yeah. They, they increase this this measure it's one of these personality traits it's called oceanic boundlessness which i kind of okay nice. yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a nice sounding thing quite an, uh, an impressive sounding one and that's mm -hmm. the similar kind of thing this feeling of um oneness this feeling of, of, of interconnectedness and that's quite a consistent report that people get from from psychedelic experiences anecdotally and then we find that in the lab as well yeah with, the, with a, an objective measure of that do they, they so is it always lab based or is it ever where, where they do set and setting and it, it changes the set set and setting so even the lab based ones uh the researchers put a lot of thought into making the lab look as little like a lab as possible right mm. nobody would want to be in this horrible white room with these people with with lab coats and that might have been what went wrong a little bit in the 1960s and 50s mm. and, and so on when they were doing these original experiments they didn't they didn't care about uh yeah. about making people feel particularly comfortable whereas nowadays you see some of the pictures uh that institutions are using you know that we, that we have at imperial college and and so on and it looks quite comfortable it looks like a living room you've got some some soft furnishings and maybe a nice lamp and i've seen pictures uh, and i believe it was sam gandhi is another uh, one of these researchers and, and used to work for the becky foundation and um there was uh prints on the wall to make it you know a kind of a forest print uh mm -hmm. on the wall to, to go as much nature and as much um comfortable feeling as possible that you can inject into that lab space to, to change that setting in a, in a pleasant way. And then we can even do tests that are outside of the lab as well. And that, cause obviously we aren't really interested in what psychedelics do in a lab, right? We're mm -hmm. more interested in what they do in people's day to day lives and everyday experience. Yep. So there's results uh, from a, a, a new research study that should be coming out within days. So um, it's quite a novel design. Um, developed um, in collaboration with Beckley Foundation and Imperial College. 
Um, and it's people that were going to microdose already. And okay. They have their own LSD, their own uh -huh. psilocybin, what have you. And they prepare their microdoses. They take the microdoses in accordance with a schedule that's provided to them by the researchers. Um, and then they complete a battery of tests and, and, uh -huh. and questionnaires and so on to test um, how they're doing. But some of them get placebo. So essentially what happens is they put them in these capsules and then they mix them all up, put them in, in, in specific labeled envelopes mm -hmm. that only the researchers know. You know they, they've sent the envelopes to these people. So they, only the researchers know what's in the envelope. And then they take, could be placebo, could be a microdose. Yeah. Uh, but they take it in their normal mm -hmm. daily life. Okay. In, in accordance with the schedule. How, how, how big of a study is that? Huge. Uh, the biggest psychedelic study to date in terms of numbers of people. Yeah, uh -huh. hundreds of people. So is that just in the UK or is that sort of global? Worldwide as well, which is, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of doing something like this. Yeah, worldwide. Oh, a wow. global self-dosing, microdosing study. Because like I that. remember like that Paul Stemitz was saying that they, they've got an app now where people can put their data in for um, uh, for microdosing and for other things as well, which is, which is quite interesting that, uh, that, 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 that going that way, which, which shows that everything's loosening up a bit on it, if you know what I mean, that, that they're having that without it being shut down straight away. Yeah. We're probably going to be seeing more and more of that, especially nowadays with COVID and who knows when we're going to be able to get people back into a lab environment. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, us at the Beckley Foundation, we're kind of starting to think about this more as well. Um, apps and, and wearable uh -huh. devices that can that measure and take measurements, um, and digital platforms and so on. We could see more and more of that in the future. Yeah. So with, with the Beckley Foundation, what I see was mainly L LSD. And you mentioned that they did psilocybin. Is there anything that else to look at or is it just focusing on, the, on those two two areas? Well, gosh, much, much broader. Yeah. I mean, so LSD is the, the personal favorite research topic of Amanda Fielding, our uh -huh. director. That's her, her favorite um, topic of study and the one that she finds most interesting. So a lot of it's LSD, yeah, but psilocybin is obviously the second maybe mm -hmm. biggest one. And, and that's getting a lot of traction now all over the world. Yep. Um, we've collaborated in the past with University College London to look at a little bit of MDMA and cannabis. Mm -hmm. Um We've done ayahuasca uh, research alongside uh, San Pau uh, University in Barcelona. Uh -huh. um, we have a collaboration with uh, ICEAS, so the International Conference on Ethnobotanical something research, a very long uh, acronym, uh -huh. um, ICEAS. And they're also based in Barcelona, but they work um, with an ayahuasca retreat in Peru. Okay. Um, and we have a collaboration with them to, to study people going into that retreat, um, you know, test them before, test them mm -hmm. after, see, see how they've done. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of Amanda's um, favorite situations to be in is to be testing these substances and, and experimenting with things that are a little bit more on the cutting edge. So yeah. psilocybin now, gosh, it's maybe even you could call it mainstream now. There's these big, uh, rich investment corporations and hedge funds and what have you investing in this latest okay. uh, mental health medicine uh -huh. but we want to be at the cutting edge and we want to be pushing the boundaries so uh looking at ibogaine um extracted from the iboga yeah. roots I, I, I want to take a trip to um, gabon for to, to try that you want to yeah yeah i was in kenya yeah. earlier on oh, last year but I, I, I couldn't go there i'm sorry yeah I've heard the experience is intense and not necessarily very pleasant. Yeah, I've heard you only do it once. Yeah, only <laughs> yeah, do it once. Right. Um, so looking at it again, and um, also you mentioned Bufo, so 5-MeO, very understudied compound, and that's something that we'd like to look at more in the future as well. So in terms not of the compound we're looking at, it's... Is another 5-MeO, isn't it, that you can do, which is... a uh another type of plant medicine. I don't know if you know about that one. Which one, sorry? Nopo. Nopo, no, I'm, I'm not. Heard Y-O-P-O. Of that. It's, a, it's a Amazonia. It's a seed from Venezuela and Peru, which you, you grind up. Uh, you grind it with... Oh, it's like a, like a snuff. Yeah, 
yeah, it's right. Yeah, because you can get five meo from from most people. The, the, the popular way is to source it from the the Bufalvarius toad, but mm. there's talk of that kind of being unpleasant for the toad for one and potentially um could lead to this this species being driven towards extinction so in terms of sustainable practices um yeah if you can get it from a, a plant or perhaps even synthetic 5-MeO DMT um could be preferable to doing that yeah yeah you don't from the from the oppo you don't get the same effect as the as the buffalo uh All right. that that's instant almost and really super strong yopo is sort of in between ayahuasca and bufo uh, but it's still a very intense um experience only lasts about an hour right um, yeah it's so you mix a seed with some uh, like bicarbonate soda and and some shells as well to, to for the calcium and and then then you sniff it yeah it's uh, could be the 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 way that you're taking it as well is going to have a lot of different uh, mm. effects on how quickly it's absorbed into your bloodstream and, and yeah. so on so um, and there's only so much you can sniff or consuming it's going to be it's going to be different yeah, there's only so much you can sniff because it's got to go in through your nose and the rest goes down the back of your throat so there's only so much you can take in at that time it's, uh, it's, uh, the other one that i just just tried yesterday so I, I can't really say a lot about it it's not hallucinogenic but it's again on that plant medicine side. I don't know if you've looked at that. It's Cambo, which the anecdotal evidence on that is um, is huge. It's so for immune system, Parkinson's, and things, all all those sorts of things. Yeah, anecdotal stuff on that is meant to be is amazing. I don't know if you've heard of any studies about that. I haven't seen anything. Do you know what compound is in it? It's it's, a, it's like a poison off a frog. Okay. okay. Um, and, and they burn. Hold on. Is it? I can't see. They burn little holes in you. I don't know if you can see. There's, there's some here. Yeah, I there's see, two. But I think I've, I've heard of that before, yeah. yeah. It's legal in the UK. You can do it. It's not something that can't be done. So uh, I don't, I'll, I'll have to tell you in a bit of time after that one. We've got this psychoactive substances bill in the UK that's uh, very broad ranging, haven't we? That um, essentially bans anything that could possibly be psychoactive. It was introduced to stop these, what are they called, designer drugs and this constant cat and mouse game yeah. between drug developers and the legal system where, you know, OK, we ban LSD, right? Well, we've got one P LSD now. OK, well, now we've got LSA or now what have yeah. you. So that constant game. So they just went, OK, we're just going to ban everything that could potentially have uh, mm -hmm. a psychoactive effect, which is horrible in, in concept, really, of just banning anything and everything. But um, so, so I'm not sure that that would be um, legal in the UK anymore. I've, I've seen ceremonies for it advertised in the UK. Uh, it's not really? psychoactive at all, really. It just oh, okay. Sick, really, and, and I, I noticed it affected my nervous system. I felt oh, I don't know, really. They say I should feel great today. I feel okay, but you know, I, can't, I, can't, I don't know if I feel any different. So we'll see. I need to try it two more times to get the full full benefits of it, and I'll be able to report back on that. Yeah, please do. Let us know how it goes. Yeah. So you're talking about a boga or ibogaine. Um, have you have you got clearance to to do a study on that or? Uh, early, very now? early stages of of looking into things. Um, always difficult to know um how much to be to be revealed but we were looking into um we're looking into it and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get some approvals to do studies uh whether that's in the uk or, or elsewhere um, I, know, I know they did in costa rica but um the, again the uh, anecdotal evidence of people going with drug problems taking it once cured yeah you no know, and, yeah. and, and that you know that's and I've, I've, I've seen a few videos on it on YouTube about it. You know, there was one, one, I don't know what you call a shaman. And she said she took loads of it one time and she was out for three months. Wow. Was it a month or three months? A month, sorry. Yeah, she was out. Regardless. <laughs> it's like, whoa. <laughs> That's yeah, serious. So the anti-addictive the anti properties are definitely the most well-known kind of... Um, potential use for that yeah as Harold Lotsoff I think a heroin addict in uh, maybe New York in the 
1960s was was one of the first ones to report that and okay. taking it once and just wow we didn't mm -hmm. want to uh, use heroin again um, and also supposedly it helps with the withdrawal symptoms from from quitting as well um, okay. so that's certainly one massive use and, and a lot of the psychedelics um, as you'll be aware have, have these anti-addictive properties um, LSD, psilocybin, ayahuasca could all potentially be used to break that kind of unhealthy thought pattern, this cycle of, of addiction that a lot of people with substance use disorders um, go through. But it began. Yeah. Quite I, I've noticed years ago when I used to take magic mushrooms in the UK, I, I've noticed that, you know, at the end of it, I'd always be like in my head, sorting my life out. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do it. It never lasts because I just go back into my old life. But it, when you look back, it's like, ah, oh, okay. I can see what he was trying to tell me there. Like, well, I just didn't listen. You know, it was... Uh, well, yeah. part of this therapeutic mechanism and trying to make it um, more of a medicine than a, than a recreational mm. drug is this idea that you have uh, preparation. You know, you talk to potentially a therapist or a doctor or a shaman or what have you. And uh, then you have the, the drug and the experience. And then you have the integration afterwards to like, right, what did you see what did you feel what do you think that means so it's that kind of combining some of these psychotherapeutic mm -hmm. concepts with with the drug as well to try and to try and make sure that it's a lasting effect and not just something that's a flash in the pan yeah my friend my friend that's what my friend's doing uh, and i was expecting for that he's, he's setting up a before and after group he's like it's got um a ceremony an ayahuasca ceremony next saturday and He's having a group with the people on Monday so we can prepare everything and get everyone ready and get everyone in the right headspace and, and, and talk about it. And then they'll have an after group as well. A lot, a lot of places don't do that now. You might have a little bit of a chat. Also, I don't speak Spanish. So I miss out on that where everyone's talking with each other afterwards. I'm sort of like, right. <laughs> catching the odd word, which isn't good. Because I normally, you know, if you find it in English, it'll cost you about 10 times more than if you find it in Spanish, the advert. Right. So, you know, I'll normally go somewhere where it's Spanish. Uh, but yeah. What, if there's what anybody, anybody listening that, uh, that that is intrigued in that kind of thing, then yeah, it would definitely be recommended to find somewhere that has this preparation and this yeah. integration because some of the experiences people have can be unpleasant. They can, they can bring up some trauma from people's childhoods and, and past experiences that perhaps they'd repressed or just don't want to think about and, that can be quite a difficult thing to go through without support. Yeah, it's 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 not always a fun experience, you know. Um, I, I I've been lucky at this time. It, it has been just therapeutic and and good and and sort of enjoyable most of the time. But you know, I've been there when people are crying, you know, the the the, the you know screaming and shouting uh, and different things are going on, and they're working through these problems. You know, it's you know it'll, it'll pass, and that and that's where those groups help because then you know it's going to pass, and that's where having a good shaman there that are going to support you through this, um, it does does make a difference. Like I went to one in, in Ecuador, and it was awful. You know, it was like a poison. The shaman didn't drink with us. He was trying to get us to finish and go to bed as quick as he could. You know, it was oh, just like, yeah, you don't need really pressure, do you, in a situation no, like it, that? It, well, it wasn't good. There was a British couple with us and, and they they were really ill all night. You know, all, all they'd done was spent all night in the toilet ostensibly, you know, it, it wasn't right. good. Yeah. So choosing the right place and the right people makes a difference, you know. It, yeah, there's this explosion really, in interest now where everybody wants to go to the Amazon, it seems, and, yeah. and have this amazing life transforming thing. And maybe that ties into what we were talking about earlier with society maybe having a little bit of a existential crisis perhaps and, and a lot of people are unhappy but it does mean that there's a potentially a lot of cowboys out there now that um don't have the the training don't really care uh, whether these westerners are going to have a, a good time or not they just want to get the money and, and go and they claim to be a shaman but you know maybe they're not maybe they come from lima and they've never never even met a shaman you know it, it, it's like you know you you'll know this for living in thailand you know a lot of people claim to be monks who uh, they're, not, they're not ordained. They could be very dodgy individuals, and um, well, you wouldn't any, know. Anyone can be a monk in Thailand. You know, all you have to do yeah, is shave exactly. your shaved eyebrows and then go go and sit in the temple. 
Yeah, that? you see them walking down the road, smoking a cigarette and browsing yeah. stuff on the, on the internet. It's not really the uh, the image you have in your mind, is it? No, my friend, my friend's doing it now at the moment. He's he's been, uh, doing it for a couple of months, like out there. So he's he's on a on a different spiritual path to me at the moment. So right. hopefully we end up in the same place. Yeah, exactly. Well, you might very well do. I mean, that's another one of these things you were talking about. You know, all these different societies in the past that. Um, could be linked to psychedelics and yeah it's true perhaps psychedelics played a role in in the development of some of these spiritual philosophical mm. movements you don't know there's there's some evidence that, that that could be the case yeah certainly the experiences and, and when you read about these gurus and spiritual people having these deep insights into the nature of the universe it sounds an awful lot like a trip doesn't it yeah very much so i think was it um was it moses was it moses Every time he spoke to God, there was like smoke coming out of the room he was in. The burning bush or whatever, yeah. yeah. I mean, if somebody burning, heard it... The burning bush, it, if that was the Arcadia tree, that's massively hallucinogenic, you know, or, or about 70% of Arcadia is a, a hallucinogenic, you know. So if, if you're stood around that, go... Phew, phew, you know, it's <laughs> tough, this burning bush, huh? Yeah, so potentially. Um Quick one before we, before we wrap up, because that's part of an hour now. Um, I see that you like walking. I, and my favourite place in the UK is Trifan. Have you been up there? I haven't, no. Have you not? Okay. Where do you like Where do you like getting out to? Anywhere that I can, really. I mean, I, it's not that I would necessarily go. I don't know. I don't drive, for example. So okay. um, not that I would drive off to some some pleasure spot and have a walk. But um, on the weekends when I can, just, just put my walking boots and, and, and walk. So Beckley... Foundation were based in uh, in Oxford, and um, Oxford okay. is a beautiful part of the country, and you, you don't have to walk far out of the city in Oxford to end up in um, in the English countryside. No, I used I used to live in Best a few years, well, quite a few years ago now, you know, and uh, so it's, it's it's nice over that way, uh, especially Oxford's nice, isn't it? You know what I mean? That, well, my my nicest memory of Oxford is, is the the covered market at Christmas. Uh, it's, it's stunning, isn't it? All the animals, unless you're vegetarian, all the animals hung up and it's just like, whoa, this is just... Uh, yeah, different I, cheeses I, and everything, yeah, lovely. <laughs> I, I think it's really, really good. So is that, before we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say about what, what's the future for Beckley or...? Um, so as I said earlier, there's a lot of interesting things that we've got going on with 5-MEO and Ibogaine. Um and the, the, the field is growing right now with, with all kinds of new people and new companies and new, and new, and new ideas. Um, and who knows what their motive behind that is, whether they're, they're in this for really wanting to help people and really want it and really believing in these compounds and, and what they could do for individuals and for society. But um, Amanda Fielding and the, and the Beckley Foundation have really um, have been in this for decades. You know, mm-hmm. Amanda set this up in 1998. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was was interested in this in this topic from the 1960s, um, and believes that this that these compounds should be available to to everybody who who needs them and, and could benefit from them, and um, doesn't want to see these things get patented and and turned into you know very slick, very swanky medicines that cost you thirty forty pound a pop. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's getting to the point where, where a lot of these, a lot of organizations like ourselves, you know, we're philanthropic, um, rely entirely on donations, mm-hmm. uh, don't receive any private funding at all, don't have investments. And in actual fact, Amanda would, would turn down okay, um, nice people hear. who wanted to invest because mm-hmm. that suggests that they want something out of it and they might be trying to influence things. So only people who, who just want to see these compounds developed into achieve the potential that that we think they could have but it means that we're entirely reliant on people's support and on uh, people yeah you, you can go share. to your website can't you and donate i see, I see yeah. the donate button on your website um and and yeah it's like i i i, I want this to hopefully to help a lot of people because it's helped me it is is the main thing that's why i really wanted to i've been sending messages out to people about to speak to about this that are more official than just me speaking to shame and friends, you know? Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been great speaking to you today. One, one more, one more thing before we go. Have you, have you read chaos? Uh, I haven't. No. Okay. Who's it by? Pardon? Who is, who's the author? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it's about 
MK Ultra and, and the Manson family and how all that tied in with the LSD that they were using and all that. It's like, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a fair play. It's an excellent book. It took the guy 30 years research. Okay. That sounds <laughs> so, interesting. And, um, there's a book that came out last year um, that you may have read, actually. Uh, some of the things you were saying sound quite uh, as if it might have been um, related to that. But uh, The Immortality Key. No, no. By a fella called um, Brian Mirror Rescue. Um, so, um, I'll, write, I'll write that down. Immortality. Amanda Fielding actually uh, gave, gave me a copy of that for Christmas. So I've still got that on my reading list. And it uh, uh -huh. sounds like it might be right up your street. Yeah, I, I'm, I, haven't got, I haven't got anything to read at the moment. So I'm looking for a, for a good book. So, uh, yeah. It's all I'll... about the potentially psychedelic underpinnings behind Christianity and, and uh, some of the world's religions. Yeah, really interesting. Maybe I'm not sure if I've seen a podcast on that. Was he on Joe Rogan? He was on Joe Rogan. Yeah, and, he was. Uh, it rings a bell. Yeah, a lot of the information I get from people who are on the Joe Rogan podcast. You know, so I used to listen to that a lot. So, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Yeah, so, and you. Uh, really great to uh, to be here. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks a lot. Take care. I'll yeah.